Welcome back everyone. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. I know it's been six months since my last upload, but I've been really busy doing other stuff. So 2023, here we go. Lots of videos are in the pipeline. Stay tuned. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe to the channel if you love what you're seeing here. And uh, yeah, let's have a chat. Today, I'd like to talk about... Okay, uh, yeah, so this is Editing Chris from the Editing Cave. Um, this video turned out to be way longer than I expected. Um, so I'm gonna split it in two episodes. Now you're watching the first one since you're seeing this. Um, the first one's all gonna be about the, the process before color grading. The second one will be the actual DaVinci Resolve tutorial. Uh, that being said, it's not a tutorial, it's more my process, but if you're interested, then I highly recommend you kind of watch both. So yeah, let's get back to uh, editing this and getting it out to you. Thanks for tuning in. Today, I'd like to talk about my color grading process. Now, process, keep that in mind, because I'd like to talk a little bit more about what happens before I get to color grade my image in DaVinci Resolve. We're going to use a project I've been working on for the last 12 months together with some local artists. It's a feature length film, my first film of that length. Now the film isn't public yet, but you can check out the trailer. I know the trailer doesn't say much about the, the story or the film itself. Um, that was intentional. The director didn't want to give away too much, but I hope you got a general feeling of the vibe of the film. It's quite a dark, dark, gloomy movie. Hence my involvement in it, because I, well, if you know my photography, I love the dark scene. There are a ton of tutorials uh, online that show you how to achieve, a, say, the Fincher look or how to copy and paste this look and put it to your image. Now, I, technically, that's possible, but practically speaking, you know, there are so many factors that are involved in, in, in creating a look and an image. So it's really important to set expectations. You're not a Hollywood production. You're watching a YouTube video. You're definitely not in a Hollywood production. Neither is the productions that we do. We don't have the tools that other people have to make their films. What we do have is the environments that we're in. So for our production here, we were shooting in East Belgium. We have a certain quality of light here that you might not get in Hollywood or anywhere else in the world. We have, you know, a different kind of environment. Light travels differently here and we have a different budget. So those things are all factors that determine your look. Obviously, being well prepared and being having, having done a lot of pre-production can go a long, long way in achieving that final image at the end. While it's totally fine to be inspired from Hollywood movies or whatever other pictures you can find that you find intriguing, I always think that it's it's okay to collect, to create a huge collection of images and looks and styles that you're going for, but those are just inspiration. And using inspiration and your limitations is what will determine your image. And, you know, some people see that as a restriction and go, I need the best camera, or I need this new lens, or I need this, this amazing new light. But it's much, much more productive to think of those limitations as opportunities. So our film, uh, the, the producer and director, Joshua Kremer, he came to me 
with you know his storyboard and with some movies that he liked and with some ideas it was a very dark gloomy dungeon like almost middle ages feeling he wanted having that in mind uh, that also informed our locations Joshua wanted to shoot the entire film you know on location on sets that we that were real places we obviously didn't have the budget to build big scenes uh, Hollywood style use a million lights and dollars of equipment But again, you know, those were limitations that we uh, used. And Joshua actually spent many, many, many weeks driving around, finding the perfect looking outdoor house, um, looking at kitchens, basements, all these places that were real. And he would send me all these photos and I got to give my input and give my feedback. That was a lot of like pre-production in location management and location scouting that helped us achieve a look or a feeling already just using a real location. Now the story, without saying too much, is about a guy who has phobia and is paranoid and can't leave his house. He's stuck. So there was a certain uncomfortableness, <laughs> uncomfortableness, a certain you know uneasiness that you had to feel. So it had to be, hence the darkness. And there's a bit of a middle age theme in there. So there was a bit of a, a dungeon feeling we wanted to have. So we wanted it to, to be dark, gloomy, almost moist, lots of like texture in the air. And to, to achieve that, you know, there's not one perfect home. Um, we actually filmed, even though the story plays in one house, we played it or we filmed it over, I think five or six different houses. This has been in the last 12 months, so I'm not quite quite sure anymore. And in one house, we just used a garage and another place we used a corridor and a, a living room and another place we used a bedroom and another place we used an office, you know, so all these like places came together to form this surreal dungeon house. And together with Joshua, I also got to determine the, the wardrobe. So he, he sent me a couple of options. We wanted like a muted cold color palette. So we went for, you know, an old worn out checkered shirt, some worn out suit pants, gray, boring. That all lent itself really well to that look that we were after. Additionally, I decided to add an awful lot of haze to most of the scenes. Everything indoor was, we were basically living in smoke for weeks, weeks, weeks and weeks. It was all about, uh, enhancing the the glow the, the, the gloominess the glow so if you add a lot of texture between the lens and your subject and the background the environment you create many layers since it you know disappears into haze but you also create um lots of particles in the air which reflect a lot of the light that you're you're putting into the environment so you get that sort of glowiness in the image and it definitely helped for the, the 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 feeling like it's like candlelight in a dungeon kind of feeling now indoor everything was lit uh, lots of the scenes we added lights from the outside as well shining in to enhance the glow backlighting haze really gives you that nice glowy those those light shafts on the interior we often used um, led tubes to enhance the existing lighting so once we moved into close-ups we tried to you know make the lighting a little more beautiful a little softer using the tubes and using diffusion it contrasted well with the cool outdoor light we used lots of warm indoor led lighting to you know have a nice light contrast between blue and yellow um, again to create separation and make the image look a bit more interesting and beautiful besides for a handful of scenes we shot the entire thing on my black magic ursa mini pro uh, 4.6k g2 amazing dynamic range and beautiful color science which you know ultimately gives me that flexibility in post to push and pull the colors a little more towards the direction that we want it to be some scenes were shot with the pocket 6k also black magic camera um, one because it's a light camera lots of overhead rigging and so on with the ursa is really difficult uh, it gets a it's quite a heavy package five to ten kilos sometimes and i don't have the equipment to rig it up high and safely so we would use the lighter pocket camera which 
also shoots in Blackmagic RAW, which you know is is perfect if you want to match cameras. Um, if you're matching the Ursa with the pocket camera, or the other way around, you know having a good starting point that's very similar in the image quality and look and feel and color palette and so on goes a long way towards uh, pushing your image into a, you know, a, a nice environment. Lens-wise, we used the DZO Picture Zooms on the Ursa quite a bit, as well as the prime lenses, the Vespid prime lenses from DZO. I own these lenses, so access was easy. They produce a beautiful image. It's sharp, has a vintagey feel, which worked well for the story. They're full cinema lenses, so they have a huge focus throw, barely any breathing. And yeah, we did quite a few zoom movements as well with you know the focus point staying at the same. They're par focal, so the focus point stays at the same spot. Yeah, in general, they're just a delight to use. Now, ultra wide, we also use the Laowa 12 millimeter lens, which uh, for some of the wide establishing shots is also great. Now additionally to the DZO lenses, the vintage feel of those lenses, I also added a black promist, a quarter black promist filter to every lens all at all times. It reduces the contrast in the image so that haziness that you get you enhance that. It'll add more glow to your image so anything that was lit any light source coming from anywhere will glow even more. If in the image it, you get a nice little glow around it and if it comes from outside of the image you still get you feel the light a lot more. And, and that really worked well to get that get to the final look of the image. I love Blackmagic design cameras and products. Um, being able to capture on a, a, a camera from Blackmagic, on a sensor from Blackmagic, and a codec by Blackmagic, and then editing it in DaVinci Resolve, which is also owned by Blackmagic, you create yourself this perfect pipeline from capture to final delivery that avoids so many problems that you might have when you jump from brand to brand and the the pipeline is just so smooth working on my mac pro it just goes so well i do use this this workflow or this pipeline for pretty much any project i work on these days Okay, that concludes part one. I hope you enjoyed this little insight into my color grading process. Like I said, color grading is more than just doing a few things in DaVinci Resolve. I did do a whole bunch of DaVinci Resolve stuff and that's going to be in part two, in video two as well. So um, I'm publishing that right now, so check it out. But I do hope you got an insight and a little bit of information that makes you understand and appreciate everything that goes into creating a look and a feeling and we we did a whole bunch of those steps for this film and i thought it you know it'd be interesting to share what goes it what what happens in my mind and what happens in the director's mind to get to a certain image to a certain look to a certain message before you know jumping into the computer and processing the image and pushing it now that happens in part two which comes right after this. It's already public. You can check it out. I'll link it down below and in the cards up at the top. Uh, you know the drill. If you enjoyed this, thumbs up, uh, comment, subscribe to the channel, and hopefully I'll see you in part two. See you there. Ciao.